So hi, everyone. Um, welcome to the second WEP seminar of the year. Um, to give you some background, WEP equips leaders and changemakers with rigorous evidence-based strategies to advance women and gender equality. My name is Maya Sen, and I'm a professor of public policy here at the Kennedy School. Some of you may know me, might have taken my class. Um, I will be leading the seminar today. And the spotlight focus of the Gender and Public Policy Seminar for the spring is gender and politics. And so we have this incredible slate of 12 speakers in this series who will be joining us virtually from around the world. Um, and today we have Professor Christina Wolbrecht who's presenting her research on a century of votes for women. And to give you some background on Christina, uh, Professor Wolbrecht is a professor at the University of Notre Dame. She is the director of the Rooney Center for the Study of American Democracy. And she has written extensively on gender and politics. She is the author most recently of A Century of Votes for Women, American Elections and Suffrage, which provides unique insight into women's and men's voting behavior and traces how women's turnout and vote choice have evolved across a century of enormous social and political transfer transformation and for women in particular. Um, and she has authored and co-authored articles on topics such as women as political role models, the representation of women and partisan position taking on education policy. Now, I should also mention that uh, Professor Wolbrecht is also the co-editor of a journal called Politics and Gender and an executive board member for Women Also Know Stuff, which is an online initiative to advance women experts in the field of political science and adjacent fields. So we welcome um, WAP's podcast community today, which has downloaded our seminars over 59,000 times. Um, and so we're so pleased to have a lasting and broad reaching impact beyond those who are here with us today. Um, and in terms of how we're going to operate today, um, Professor Wolbrecht is going to speak for about 45 minutes, um, Christina, yep. and that leaves us with 15 minutes for Q&A from the virtual audience. So please hold your questions until the end of the talk. Um, those of you who have a question as Christina goes along will have the opportunity to be unmuted to ask the question out loud. Um, we do ask that any audience questions be brief um, and on topic and be posed in the form of a question and related to the presentation that we're going to hear today. Um, and our colleague Katie Omberg is going to be managing the Q&A. There she is. Um, so with that, I will pause there and turn it over to our wonderful speaker for today, Christina Wolbrick. Thank you so much, Maya. It's uh, really a pleasure um, and an honor to be here today. Um, I'm going to make one program note, which is that we're having something extremely unusual here in South Bend um, in February, which is that the sun is out and my shades are making weird lights on me. Um, and so uh, if, I, if I suddenly am blinded, uh, uh, I, please uh, excuse the temporary moment, but um, we get so little sun that we, we have to enjoy it. So it's uh, really my pleasure to be here today um, to be part of this um, incredible series and talk a little bit about some work I've been doing uh, uh, for some years now, actually, um, on how women voted after suffrage. So I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen. Um, and hopefully it's worked just as well as it did before. Excellent. All right, so um, most of what I'm gonna to present today is, is based on a book that came out just last year called A Century of Votes for Women. Uh, and I should be sure to give um, a good chunk of the credit to my collaborator, um, Kevin Corder. This is our second book uh, on this sort of general topic. The first one was on women voters immediately after suffrage. And then this one was sort of designed as a broad overview um, uh, for the, for the uh, for the suffrage centennial. So as I hope you know, and we're gonna get slides to go ahead here. There we go. Uh, we just celebrated last year, uh, the centennial of the 19th amendment. And the 19th amendment says you cannot discriminate on the basis of sex when it comes to voting rights. Um, one of the things that I, I absolutely wanna sort of acknowledge up front is it's not appropriate to say that the 19th amendment enfranchised women. All it said is that sex could not be a reason uh, that women could not vote. That left Jim Crow uh, uh, policies and uh, informal and formal policies in the South keeping black women from voting. Uh, that left prohibitions against many native women, indigenous women from voting uh, and um, uh, uh, left in place uh, many of the uh, citizenship challenges that Asian women in particular um, uh, uh, faced. Um, Almost immediately after, and I think a lot of the, um, the suffrage centennial was about sort of how this amendment was passed and how we think about the 19th Amendment in what is a very long and complex and ongoing struggle over concept of citizenship, membership, uh, and voting rights in the United States. And I'd be happy to talk more about that um, in the Q&A. 
What I'm going to focus on today is what did women, those women who could vote, and we'll be talking about that, um, do with this voting right, right? What are women voters going to do? Um, and in particular, what I want to do in this talk is talk about what the press, the public, politicians, and even academics believed about women voters and what women voters actually did. Um, and I'm going to try to uh, sort of convince you of, of two things. So here's the spoilers for um, the conclusions I'm going to reach. One is that um, this hundred year period since, since the 19th Amendment is characterized by persistent gender stereotypes. It doesn't mean that there hasn't, as Maya mentioned, been dramatic social and economic changes, right? The women's lives in 2020 look dramatically different from 1920. But these fundamental ideas, many of which were the rationale for not enfranchising women to, to begin with, ideas that women are fundamentally not political, that they are concerned more with, in this cartoon, men with mustaches and crying babies, than they are with sort of uh, political um, uh, aspects. That women are primarily entering the political realm as mothers, an idea that goes back to the founding and the concept of Republican motherhood. And so I'm gonna try and show you how we sort of see that while the language changes, now we talk about suburban housewives, right? That many of these same themes are, are quite consistent. I also want to convince you that there is no woman voter. And so lots of the early stories in particular, but far into the 20th century, we talk about the woman voter this year, or what does the woman voter want? Um, and one of the things I hope to convince you is that women like men, and I prepare yourselves for this information, are incredibly diverse in their identities, in their interests, uh, in the issues that they care about, et cetera. And I'm gonna, we're gonna hopefully see this, this um, diversity across a, a number of dimensions. So as I said, um, the sort of ratification of the 19th Amendment brings on all this interest on how women are actually going to vote. These are headlines from the 1920s through until the 2016 um, presidential election. Um, and again, this sort of constant sort of search to try to understand who women voters are and what impact they're going to have on the electorate. This is, of course, the largest um, expansion of of suffrage, um, excuse me, in American history. And so how and, and with what consequences uh, becomes really important. So the early conventional wisdom, I'm gonna talk about three political periods here, middle of the 20th century, I'm gonna talk about right during the 20s and I'm gonna talk about more recent times. The very first period we're gonna look at is the 20s and the conventional women about, the conventional wisdom about women voters emerged quite quickly. And that was that all of that work, all of that effort, all of that campaigning had really been a waste because women's suffrage was a failure. Um, and you see this, uh, this is probably the only talk in your series, I don't know, uh, that will uh, have a headline from Good Housekeeping, um, as well as the Washington Post uh, and other sorts of magazines. But as early as, right, the ratification is in 20, women vote in 20, mostly, I'll talk about that in a second. Um, as early as 23 and 24, there's already this sort of widespread idea that women's suffrage is a failure. Um, it wasn't just journalists and the public that were asking this question. Um, this is one of the few early art, uh, academic articles written on um, women voters, and the title pretty much tells you everything that you need to know. Um, I can tell you, because I've had the pleasure of doing it, that if you go and read textbooks from the 50s, 60s, and 70s, American politics textbooks that talk about women voters. They'll make claims that, you know, after suffrage, mostly didn't women, didn't vote, and it took a long time. And if you follow them all down, they'll come to probably cite this article and like a New York Times article quoting a party boss from Albany about women's turnout, right? And so um, we really don't know much about how women voted, but the, the expectation was that they, they basically did not use um, the ballot. Um, so what do we mean when we say women's suffrage was a failure? Um, one thing in particular, um, we're going to talk about two, but one in particular I want to start with is this idea that women just didn't vote, right? That had always been an anti-suffrage claim that women didn't want the ballot. Uh, this quote is for a, from a well-known popular history of the 1920s. The American woman run the, won the suffrage in 1920. She seemed, it is true, to be very little interested in it once she had it. So. This idea, women didn't want the vote and women didn't use the vote. Um, I want to take a moment then to sort of look at that um, more um, empirically and, and see what it is that we can actually conclude. 
Um, it turns out it's really hard to say much about the very first women voters. Um, we do not put pink and blue ballots into ballot boxes. And so you cannot tell from the uh, official election record how women voted and how men voted. That, that, that information does not come out of the official voting record. The main way of solving that problem is, of course, the mass poll, is the surveys, right? But we really do not have reliable social uh, sort of surveys, surveys of voters, until at earliest the 30s and the 40s. Uh, they really, for the most part, don't um, uh, exist in the 1920s. I'll be happy to talk about um, a few exceptions. And so uh, Kevin Corder and I, our first book, used some new data and some new methods to come up with estimates of how men and women voted um, in 10 different states in the United States. And that's what this data from the 20s is all going to be based on these estimates. And I'm happy to talk about why you should believe me when I tell you that these are, are, are good and reliable estimates. So in this first graph, we're just looking at the turnout of men and women, women in purple, men in the mustard color, and clearly women's turnout initially. These are elections, presidential elections from 20 to 36, so the first five. Um, women's turnout lags that of men. Um, it's increased, they're both increasing over time as we move into the New Deal period. Women's is increasing uh, a little bit faster. And the long-term story of women voters and turnout is pretty much exactly that, that over time women slowly, slowly increase until by 1980, they are more likely to turn out than our men. But 1980 is of course 60 years uh, after the ratification of the 19th Amendment. You'll remember that I wanted to convince you that things are more complicated and that women are more diverse. Uh, and here I want to talk particularly about diversity across time and place. So um, in this graph, we're looking at women's term, women's in purple and men's in mustard turnout in 1920 in uh, these 10 different states. Um, what you can see is in every single state, again, that purple bar is lower, women are less likely um, to turn out to vote. Um, but there's considerable variation, right? So here in Virginia in 1920, fewer than 10% of women turned out to vote in the first election in which they were uh, able to do so. The numbers are only a little bit higher in places like Massachusetts, you're on Massachusetts uh, and Connecticut where the turnout is about 20%. On the other hand, in places like Missouri and Kentucky, the turnout of women in 1920 is at or above 50%, half of all women who had never voted before in either of those states turn out to vote in the election of 1920. And so the question is, what makes women in Missouri and Kentucky different from women in Virginia, Massachusetts, and Connecticut? Are the women in Missouri and Kentucky just less female? Uh, they're more interested in politics. Um, and the women in Virginia and Massachusetts and Connecticut are more traditionally feminine. Um, that's certainly one of the arguments that is often made about Southern women. I want to argue, um, uh, however, that the women in Missouri and Kentucky came into enfranchisement in a very different context than the women in Virginia, Massachusetts, and Connecticut. Um, one of the ways, of course, had to do with legal barriers to voting. So throughout the South, including Virginia, um, but also in states like Massachusetts and Connecticut as well, there were important uh, barriers um, to women uh, voting. There were poll taxes, uh, literacy tests that are of course um, uh, both biased to begin with and then applied in, in biased ways and often very long residency requirements. I wanna mention this one in particular. Uh, many states, especially in the South during this period um, would require you to register to vote um, you know, and pay your poll tax a good six, eight, even a, eight months, a year before election. And so I'll point out this ad that I have here, which is from Texas, says you must pay your poll tax on or before January 31st, right, for a November election. So many, many months in advance. Um, lots of states had this provision. Many of them held special sessions in which they made exceptions for women to pay poll taxes and register. In four states in the American South, however, those states said, well, that's very nice about the 19th Amendment, ratified at the end of August, uh, but you missed our deadline for registration, and so you can't participate in 1920. We'll see you in 1924. Okay, so in some places, women actually were not um, permitted to, to vote. Even where they were, of course, um, they had to face these barriers. And we have lots of reasons to think that these barriers might particularly hamper women. Why do I say that? Uh, if your family can barely afford one poll tax, you're probably not gonna spend more money so that the wife 
um, can vote. Uh, if, if you're a woman who has never gone to vote in an election before and are already uncertain if this is an appropriate thing to do, knowing that you're going to face poll taxes or a hard uh, you know, literacy test, these sorts of things, probably discourages you from voting. And this is actually um, what, we ha uh, what we see. So this is the turnout um, among women and men, uh, left and right. Um, among in states that have very restrictive voting laws, that's the, the yellow, and states that have very few barriers. Um, and what we can see is that in both cases, um, you know, there's this drop off when you go from a place with very few barriers to a place with poll taxes, all this sort of thing. But that the drop off from women is substantially bigger than the drop off from men. Women's votes are suppressed more by things like poll taxes. Et cetera. Now, it should go without saying that those things were designed to keep in the South African Americans um, from voting, and of course, it was Black women in particular uh, that whose uh, turnout was was um, impacted. Um, although there's a reason why, in the late 20s and early 30s, white women in the South also organized against uh, the poll tax, and it had less to do with their commitment to racial equality and more to do with their own self-interest that that was keeping them from voting. In places like Massachusetts and Connecticut, the goal was to keep new immigrants from voting. This was going to have an enormous impact. I can tell you that in the 1920 census, both uh, Massachusetts and Connecticut, more than 60% of their population was first or second generation um, immigrants. So this is affecting huge parts of the population. I also want to highlight um, differences across the states in terms of party competition. Um, not entirely unlike today, the 1920s was a period of widespread one-partyism. This was, of course, dramatically so in the South, where the Democratic Party uh, more or less completely controlled. Uh, and in fact, it's probably not accurate to describe the, the South as a functioning uh, democracy um, during this period. But it was also true in the North and the West, where by large percentages, um, Republicans dominated many of those states. Um, it turns out, you'll remember that um, I, I pointed out how competitive and how close Missouri and Kentucky were. And I'll just point out that Kentucky is one of the few light blue states, so it leans Democratic, but that it's competitive. And actually in 1920, the, the, the vote, presidential vote in Kentucky came down to 0.05%. So it was an incredibly close election. And here in Missouri, which is also um, uh, light pink, so leans Republican, but not dramatically so. Uh, sure enough, uh, as we go from states that are competitive, truly competitive, there are a few of those, to dominated by the Republican Party, and then the particular case of Southern states dominated by the Democratic Party, for both women and men, turnout's going to drop, right? You're most, most of that turnout's in competitive elections. Every vote counts. The parties are out there trying to get everybody, even women, to turn out to vote because the election is so very close, right? But again, we see a more dramatic fall off among women, right? So always a fall off, but where, you know, going from competitive to um, one party Republican is about a 10 to 12 point drop for men. It's an almost 20 point drop for women. What this means is that there were bigger differences between women in terms of turnout than there were between women and men. So the difference in the probability of turnout of a woman in Virginia, right, large African American population, lots of barriers to voting, uh, authoritarian state, and women living in Kentucky, very competitive, no barriers to voting, et cetera, is 50 points, right? Um, your experience as a woman was determined much more by where you lived than by the fact that you happen to be a woman, right? And so gender matters, but it matters in different ways in different contexts. Um, I wanna just quickly point out, as I said, that as of 1980, this is again, turnout of women and men, women are always in purple, um, uh, women's turnout, and this included uh, through 2020, um, has, has exceeded the rate of men's turnout. Now, you'll remember my quote about women not being very interested in uh, voting. Uh, Frederick Lou Allen goes on to say, she voted, but mostly as the unregenerate men about her did. This was the other failure argument, and that was that, why did we bother enfranchising women? They just vote uh, like men do, right? They're, well, all we've done is double the size of this argument was actually more pointed, however. It wasn't just that men and women similarly situated in the economy, ethnically, racially, uh, uh, religiously, et cetera, voted similarly, but rather that men were simply telling their wives how to vote. 
Um, these are headlines. One's the Boston Globe uh, in 1920. The other is the Detroit Free Press in 1952. This is an argument that persists far into the middle of the 20th century. This claim had really clear consequences. Um, so poster George Gallup here, who's going to more or less invent um, sort of public opinion polling in the 30s and the 40s, um, purposefully undersampled women. He wanted to understand what is the thought process by which voters decide who they're going to vote for. Right? I got to ask about policy and candidates and and uh, uh, press attention, um, but I really don't have to to ask women because I already know is what Gallup was saying here in 1940. They'll do as they were told the night before that they'll just ask her. Um, this basic presumption. Um, is very strong in the earliest political science research on um, uh, voting. The real classic studies that have really set the agenda for public opinion and voting research for the last, what are we going on now, 70 uh, some years. Um, if, if you were lucky enough to be a student of American politics, these would be sort of like holy grails to you. Uh, the original voting and the American voter and then Phil Converse's um, important public opinion statement, the nature of belief systems in mass pu publics. And all of these authors, and of course, Converse is part of the American voter, um, agree, right? Um, they looked at this early voting data. They saw that women were slightly less likely to turn out to vote than were men, and that they tended to vote more or less Republican, Democrat, uh, the same as men did. And they came to clear conclusions about what had happened, right? Um, uh, the wife who votes, but otherwise pays little attention, abides by the ultimate decision of the husband. The wife is very likely to follow her husband's opinions. However, imperfectly, she may have absorbed their justifications at a more complex level, says Converse. So I want to, uh, again, um, evaluate the evidence for this really popular idea um, throughout really the first half of the 20th century about how women use their ballots once they gave them. Uh, I'm going to pick on Berylson, Lazarfield, and uh, McPhee, but uh, we can do this with the other authors as well. Um, this is the quote that I just had on the last page. And in purple, I'm trying to show um, four different empirical claims made in these two sentences, right? Men tell their wives how to vote. Men do not particularly respect their wives. Wives trust their husbands when it comes to political matters. And husbands perceive a need to reply or guide. So what evidence, right? Berylson, uh, Lazarfeld, and McPhee are, are literally you know, pioneering uh, early community studies and, and social science research about voting and public opinion. Um, best I can tell, um, their evidence for this claim comes from this figure. And if I could get Excel to make graphs like this, I think I would, because it's awesome. Um, here's what this figure is, is showing. Um, uh, well, first of all, they're trying to make a point about the fact that people discuss politics more in October, which is on the right, than they do in July, June, excuse me, on the left, right? Um, not surprisingly, right before a political camp, right before an election, we get a lot more election discussion. What we're seeing in the crosshair in the gray is women, and in the uh, uh, clear bars um, are men, right? So what is the evidence here that men tell their wives how to vote? The questions, they're not actually the same questions at two different time periods. I thought I'd give the public opinion people out there a little panic attack uh, about what used to pass uh, for a, a, a time series. Um, have you talked politics with anyone recently? Who was the last person you discussed the election or the candidates with? Now, this data showing that women are much more likely to say they went to a family member than are men may very well be consistent with the claim men tell their wives how to vote. I want to be clear, however, that that is not what the question actually asks. It doesn't ask how do you make your decision to vote? Do you listen to your husband? Those sorts of questions. One might think, for example, that if during this period, and we're looking at the late 40s and the 1950s, women were more likely to stay at home than to work outside the home, they might just be more likely to talk to family members about politics because they're simply more likely to talk to family members almost exclusively, right? And so there are some other explanations for um, why we might see these same sorts of patterns. So, I think it's entirely possible, even likely, that a number of men told their wives how to vote and a number of women uh, did as their husbands instructed. It's not clear to me that we can evaluate how widespread that was, however, from the data in front of us.
Um, what about these other empirical claims? Uh, don't respect their wives, wives trust their husbands, et cetera. None of those questions were actually asked. Um, and, and there's sort of no presentation of evidence in this book to support that sort of claim. Again, might be true, but we don't have good data to evaluate how widespread that behavior actually is. I wanna sort of take Berylson, Lazar, Phil, and McPhee off the hook here a little bit, right? As social scientists, we do this all the time. We look at patterns in the data and we have our own assumptions and ideas about how the way the world works that help explain that data. Well, it's probably this or that, right? Um, and to the extent that we wanna be good social scientists, we push that harder. Well, how do I know if you know, I'm getting this pattern because women don't care about politics or I'm getting this pattern because of some other phenomenon. Um, I think the story of sort of the early voting studies just reminds us to always be thinking about what our assumptions are, right? Um, despite the 19th Amendment, these scholars are looking out and seeing overwhelmingly patriarchal, you know, structured households where men are in leadership positions, where men are more engaged in politics, and they're coming to sort of clear um, conclusions. This doesn't mean that's the only conclusion they could have reached, however. Um, this is a ninth, uh, uh, really interesting, very long, actually, New York Times uh, story on uh, women voters in uh, 1956, uh, written probably not surprisingly um, by, uh, by a woman. Um, and uh, Mona Brown goes on to say, if married couples tend to vote the same way, and they do, that is, by the way, still true today, it is because their environment gives them the same orientation rather than because the woman rubber stamps the man's choice. Uh, the way I like to say this in class is I also vote the same way that my husband does. Uh, it's possible that that is because he tells me how to vote, uh, but there might be other reasons that we have shared interests, shared identities, uh, and shared concerns that lead us to very similar um, discussion, uh, conclusions uh, when it comes to voting. So we talked about the 20s and nobody, no women are voting. We talked about the 50s and women are just voting as their husbands do. Surely by the time we get to the 21st century uh, and we've had you know, generations of political scientists and, and data-driven journalism, we're going to do a better job. Um, I would like to tell you the story about 2020. Um, I am gonna show a little bit of 2020 data at the end. Uh, the problem with 2020 is that the exit polls are wonky uh, and we don't have the good data for 2020 yet. So I'm gonna focus on 2016. And of course, 2016 is this enormous historic election, right? On one side, you've got a party nominating the first woman ever uh, a major party nominee in American history. On the other side, you have Donald Trump, this candidate who has been credibly accused of saying and doing pretty terrible things when it comes to women, right? So my God, gender just seems up front and center. It must have a huge impact on how people are voting. Um, and we did get those sorts of claims. The top is NPR, the bottom is 538, right? The Trump-Clinton gender gap could be the largest in more than 60 years. Men are treating 2016 as a normal election, women are not. I do wanna point out, uh, I'll, well, I'll say a lot about the gender gap, right? The presumption here is that it is women who look at these two candidates and cannot vote for Donald Trump and must vote for Hillary Clinton, right? And I just want to think about the, un the assumptions underlying that. Women care about gender. Gender is more important to them than other identities uh, in determining their vote choice. Men don't really care about those sorts of issues. Um, and their vote choice is going to be determined by something very different, right? I want to be, as we're sort of thinking about these assumptions, all right, and all the claims afterwards, how could women vote for Donald Trump, right? You need to ask yourself why that's so surprising. And so I want to have in mind what what is it you what what assumptions do you have where you think it's outrageous that a woman would vote for Donald Trump, but somehow a man voting for Donald Trump seems reasonable. So I want to put 2016 in context in a couple of ways. Um, one is I want to talk about the gender gap in, in presidential elections. And so what this figure is showing you from 1952 through 2016, the percentage of women who voted Democratic minus the percentage of men who voted Democratic. This is a measure of the gender gap. And what this is showing you is that in the 1950s and through the 1960s, more women were actually more likely to vote for Nixon than they were for Kennedy, despite all the stories about women swooning over him. Women were slightly more likely to vote um, Republican. Um, I wanna point out that this is actually a worldwide phenomenon. In the decades immediately following the enfranchisement of women, uh, uh, particularly in advanced industrial democracies, 
uh, we saw a consistent favoring of center-right parties by women uh, compared to men. Um, and that was sort of seen as traditional, more religious women, um, et cetera. Since about 1980 in the United States, we've had the opposite uh, pattern, which is women are more likely to vote Democratic than are men. This is also a worldwide phenomenon. Um, again, in most other advanced industrial democracies, women are slightly more likely to vote for center-left parties uh, than um, are men, okay? So we're in this period of time in which we have um, a gender gap that favors uh, the Democratic Party among women. Um, so the question is, what's going to happen? There we go. What's going to happen in 2016, right? Donald Trump, Hillary Clinton, surely we're going to have a gigantic gender gap. So now I'm going to show it to you. Ah, no, I didn't. I did it wrong. Right? I hope you didn't miss it. What we see in 2016 is a gender gap that is not particularly large, uh, not particularly dramatic, and in fact, perfectly in keeping with sort of what gender gaps have looked like since about 1980. Well, why and how did this happen? Once again, we very quickly get a conventional wisdom. This is basically, it's Clinton's fault for not being able to mobilize more white women. That for some reason, white women didn't like Hillary Clinton, White women found Trump attractive. Maybe it was, you know, anti-immigrant or trade or uh, uh, racism, whatever it was. Um, lots of white women voted for Donald Trump. Um, and what does this sort of say about white women and their interests, sort of, et cetera? Now, I'm pleased to say that political scientists um, almost immediately, and here particularly Jane Jun has done a great job at USC, of uh, pointing out that the pattern we see in 2016 is not particularly unique, right? If, if anything, the story we should be telling is despite having Donald Trump and Hillary Clinton, we got such a normal election outcome in 2016. So this graph is showing the percent of white women in uh, mustard and black women in purple voting for the Republican candidate um, from 1952 until 2016. And that gray line is 50%. Um, and what you can see is that a ma vast majority, especially after about 1964, vast majority of African-American women have voted Democratic, that is not Republican, uh, in elections. But in virtually every election uh, since 1952, with two exceptions, a majority of white women have voted for the Republican Party, right? Um, and, and what we see clearly here is that any race gap is dramatically larger than any gap we're going to see in terms of gender. And I'm happy to talk more about that. So in 1964, when everybody voted Democratic, um, uh, so did, uh, uh, this was Goldwater, uh, so did white women. And in 1996, there was actually a shift enough uh, that a majority of white women uh, voted for Bill Clinton's reelection. Um, those of you who are good graph readers are saying, but Christina, I see that 1992 is also down there. Um, this is the two party vote um, because, um, why is his name totally gone from my head? Because there was a credible third party challenger, Ross Perot, there we go. In 1992, there's actually no candidate got a majority, uh, if we include the third party vote there, uh, got women's vote or frankly anybody else's vote in uh, 1992. So let me emphasize this point um, again. Um, these graphs are again showing support for the Republican party uh, in 2012, right? So this is the year that Mitt Romney uh, is the Republican nominee and Barack Obama is the Democratic nominee. And the most outrageous thing that Mitt Romney said about women was that he had binders full of them, right? So we wouldn't, if, if we think this is all about gender, we wouldn't particularly think that's gonna be uh, particularly stimulating. And so um, we have white voters here on the left, women, men in, in mustard, women in uh, uh, purple, and then African-American voters here on the right, again in 2012. So I want you to see two things. I want you to see that there's a gender gap in both groups. Among both whites and African-Americans, men are more likely to vote Republican than are women. And we see that consistently across nearly all racial and ethnic groups uh, in recent elections. The other thing I want you to notice again is that the gaps between say white men and African-American men or white women and black women are dramatically larger than any gap between men and women in any racial and ethnic group. So what happened then in 2016? Again, um, as we sort of saw in the last graph, this is going somewhere, I promise you, um, 
what's remarkable about 2016 is how very little change there is, right? Those, those figures and those uh, confidence intervals really do not look particularly different in 16 compared to 12, right? Uh, Donald Trump and, and Mitt Romney. Um, on the African-American side, we also don't see a whole lot of change. If anything, there's a rising percentage of African-American men and women uh, voting for Donald Trump. I think most scholars would, would assign this less to the attraction of Donald Trump to African-American voters and more to the overwhelming support that President Obama in 2008 and 2012 got from this community. And so in a sense, 2016 is part of a return to a more normal um, uh, Republican vote share in the African-American community. So you'll remember one of my themes was persistence, uh, two of my themes, right? Persistence and stereotypes, right? Women should vote on the basis of being women, right? This should be the dominant sort of thing that, that, that pushes them forward. What we're seeing here is that gender matters, but it doesn't matter as much as other identities such as race. Um, we're also seeing, right, that very diversity, of course, that women are diverse that we were just talking about. And here we see racial diversity. I also wanna talk a little bit more in depth um, about other forms of diversity. And so um, if we look at the previous panel, it looks like there's almost no movement among women. Even if we just look at white women and we look at black women, there's just not very, very many shifts. The story gets a little different if we dial down even farther and think about educational differences. And so this graph like the last is showing for two groups of voters, um, support for the Republican party, among those without a college degree on the left, among those with a college degree on the right, women again in purple, men in, um, in the mustard. Um, we can see already um, that there is somewhat higher support for the Republican Party amongst those without a college degree than there is among those who do have a college degree. That alone is sort of a historic shift. Um, and, and I think an important part, important dynamic in our politics today. So what happens then in response to Donald Trump in 2016? What we see amongst uh, voters without a college degree is an increase in sort of support for the Republican party, increase in support for Trump. That increase, however, is much more dramatic among women without a college degree than among men without a college degree. In fact, so much so that whites without a college degree are one of the only sort of subgroups that we're gonna see in 2016 where the gender gap is at least eliminated and maybe even a reverse. Women are actually slightly more Republican. Now the confidence intervals tell me those aren't really real differences, but nonetheless, as opposed to almost everywhere else, um, we don't see that democratic advantage among white women without a college degree. Um, the way I like to say that is all those New York Times stories and all those reporters in those diners interviewing working class men should have been talking to the waitresses instead, right? That, that this group was part of the big swing, um, a part of an important swing to Donald Trump. And almost certainly that reality is part of the reason that Trump talked so much about suburban women and the things he did for women when running for election in 2020. What about white women and white men with a college degree? Here we see the same pattern, but in the opposite direction. There's a move amongst college educated whites away from Trump and towards the Democratic Party. That shift, however, is far greater among white women with a college degree than among white men with a college degree, right? And so in a sense, these two groups of, of white women are both moving in opposite directions, right? Overall, it's gonna look like no movement at all. But if we look more closely, we see that there's you know, levels of diversity among women voters that we need to be attentive to if we're really gonna understand the dynamics of gender and American elections. I'm gonna show you that same data for, um, for African-Americans. I'm a little reluctant to do so. This is all data from the American National Election Study, which frankly doesn't you know, sample enough um, minority uh, voters uh, in general. Um, I'm happy to talk about why and how that is, um, oh, or black specifically, but I wanna point out, you see the same pattern, right? Among black women without a college degree, they go from virtually no votes for Republicans in 12 to some votes for Republicans in 2016. Whereas among black women with a college degree, you see some votes for Mitt Romney and the Republicans in 2012, and you see what is virtually none, there's no confidence interval there because it crosses zero, uh, votes among college educated black women for Trump in 2016. This is of course hugely important 
uh, for understanding um, our changing electorate. And this is just making the point of um, the dramatically diversifying American electorate. The gray line is the percentage of the census uh, that uh, falls into the category of uh, racial and ethnic minorities. Um, purple is the percentage of uh, uh, women of color who are voting uh, over time. Uh, purple, excuse me, yellow is the percentage of uh, minority men who are voting over time. You can see, of course, in the 40s and the 50s and before the Civil Rights Act, the dramatic underrepresentation of voters of color. And you can also see in the later period, and again, we saw that, of course, dramatically in 2020, um, that were, you know, the representation is much better and the size of the group has, has increased dramatically. So I am very close to being out of time, but I'm going to show you two quick graphs about 2020. Uh, and then I'm really looking forward to your questions. Um, uh, as I said, most of the quote unquote good data is not out there. Uh, but Brian Schaffner uh, at the Congressional Election Study, uh, Cooperative Election Study, excuse me, uh, has been great about making some of this, uh, some of their data available a little bit early. Uh, and so this is just showing the gender gap, the percent voting Democratic in this case, women um, and men. You, you know, there's not a whole lot of movement uh, still here um, uh, in compared to the past. We see a slight widening, mostly driven by men in 2016, and we definitely see a little bit more widening as well in, in 2020. Um, driven, it looks mostly to me, again, by, uh, by women, uh, or by women in this particular case, but again, nothing sort of outside of what we might be expecting. Uh, again, I would love to show this in lots of different ways. I'm, I'm gonna sort of stuck with what they have. Um, we can also look at this question about uh, white women voting for um, uh, Biden. So here on the top, um, are college educated voters, uh, white women with college degrees in green, uh, white men with college degrees in, in uh, uh, blue. And you can basically see in 2016 that pattern I just discussed, right, where this college education becomes a big difference among both men and women, um, uh, excuse me, white women and white men. Um, uh, college degrees become more distinctive. Uh, and that trend is certainly including, uh, continuing in 2020, it looks like among uh, whites with a college degree, if anything, it looks like Trump may have lost some uh, support amongst whites um, without a college degree um, here at the bottom. And with that, I'm gonna stop uh, talking and I'm gonna stop sharing my screen and I look forward to your questions. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Christina. If you have a question that you would like to ask our presenter, please uh, click on the blue raise hand. And I've heard that this is now in two places, depending on if you've updated Zoom or not. One is under the participants tab, the other is under reaction. So if you hit that blue raise hand function, I will know you wanna ask a question and can unmute you. Conversely, you can also write a question in the chat. And I'm gonna kick us off with a question that I saw come in on the chat, Christina, around different elections, which is, do you have data on the gender differences during elections for FDR? And do you have data on gender differences for Kennedy's election? Because women were accused of voting for the more handsome of the two, not that they were voting for one or the other based on political issues or trust of Richard Nixon. Uh, all of that is accurate. So we do not have, in general, very good survey data from the period of the New Deal realignment. So, so Franklin Roosevelt's elections in 32 through the 40s. Um, the work that Kevin and I did in our first book, though, looked specifically at this sort of new, those New Deal elections, right? So the 1930s and the FDR elections are a big deal because it's this dramatic political change in American history. The Republicans had basically dominated uh, national politics at the end of the Civil War. And with the Great Depression, um, uh, we get this huge transformation of the Democrats being the majority party in terms of identification and vote choice in the United States. Um, a shift like that can only happen uh, two ways. <laughs> One is uh, what we would call conversion, and the use of a religious term is, is not entirely accidental, which is that people who had previously voted Republican say, I'm sick of this, I'm voting for Franklin Roosevelt, and they vote Democratic. The other is mobilization, is that voters who hadn't previously been in the electorate come in and start voting in large numbers, um, and they vote for this new party. We know both of these things are happening during the New Deal. Uh, huge waves of immigration in the 1920s meant there were lots of voters um, who had uh, lots of new citizens who had not yet voted before 28, 32, and 36. 
Um, and they come dramatically into those elections in part, well, it's the Dallas Smith story, but it's also a, a Great Depression story. We would expect women to be in both of those categories, right? One, when we think about conversion, we know that the longer you vote, the more strong your party identification is. Women have been systematically denied the opportunity to sort of solidify their party choice by repeated election, right? This 32 is only the fourth election uh, since 1920. And so we might think that women would be more likely to convert. Um, we also know that women were, you just saw, women were dramatically under mobilized in the 1920s, that there were just a lot more women who hadn't yet voted than there were of men. And so you might think that that women were more likely to be sort of newly mobilized. Okay, I haven't voted, I haven't voted before, but I'm going to vote now. I'm going to vote Democratic. Long story short, we find both of those things are true. That women, uh, our data suggests, are more likely to convert. That if we're Republicans, become Democrats, and they're more likely to be newly mobilized. And so there's something like I'm going to get these numbers wrong. There's something like six million new Repub Democratic voters. Um, by 36 and literally half of those come from women and half of those come from men, despite the fact that women are, are a much smaller part and been a much smaller part of the electorate, if that makes any sense. Um, one of the funnest, part about, funnest parts about this project was looking at newspaper stories. Uh, I had students systematically uh, uh, gather newspaper stories in a bunch of newspapers um, over the 20 to, to 2020. And the 60 stories, which we quote at length in the book are fantastic. Um, literally phrases like middle-aged women, well, women in the clutch of middle age, reaching out to touch John Kennedy, swooning, the, the huge crowds, et cetera. Um, we have known, however, since 1960, George Gallup was writing about this in his regular column, that despite all that swooning, despite um, the attractions of John Kennedy, um, women were um, significantly, wasn't enormous, but significantly more likely to vote for Richard Nixon um, than they were to vote for for John Kennedy. So there is a pro-Republican gender gap among women uh, in 1960. Um, and I think that's an, another great example. It turns out that women are, do not make their voting decisions entirely on the basis of uh, who is more handsome. Yeah, real shocker there. I know. <laughs> I'm, I'm here to, to blow your minds. Yeah. <laughs> Everyone get off the edge of your seat. Watch out. Write that down. Don't call me on that. That's fine. <laughs> Zoe, I see you got your hand up. I'm going to ask you to unmute now. Great. All right. Um, I'm, I found this super interesting. Thank you so much for your presentation. I, I'm from Georgia, and so I'm interested to learn a little more about um, if you have any data on modern differences across states. I found that very interesting in the 20s that you noticed a difference in variation around barriers to voting for women in the South. And it seems like we had a change in Georgia for the first time. And I wondered if you thought, if you had seen any data yet around differences in states, modern around barriers to voting or around the role of women getting out the, the vote more than men. Uh, that's one question. And then another question which you may not have data on, but something I'm interested in is if you know anything about um, the differences between men and women and the issues that they prioritize and if you've done research in that area. Thank you. Yep. Okay, I'm gonna answer the first question about Georgia by not answering it. And, and, and here's how, what I mean by that. Um, part of what we were trying to do in this book, and you saw a little bit of that today, is, is frankly sort of a critique of social science. And one of the points we're trying to make is that the assumptions we bring to research guide the conclusions that we can reach. So the Gallup example I gave you is a, is a classic example of this, right? Where he's just like, there's nothing to study here, so we just don't study it, right? And so we don't have as much data on women in these early polls because George Gallup thought they weren't worth talking to. Um, another important change that's gonna happen um, in sort of the evolution of voting research in the United States is the introduction then of the national survey, right? What we're looking for is to have a gauge of national public opinion. And so major sources like the American National Election Study, the, the um, General Social Survey, et cetera, right? Their goal is to sample enough for people to say something representative about the entire country. Um, what has been lost in that, and part of what we tried to recover, is this attention to, to context, exactly what you said. And both Kevin Corder and I were students of John Spriggs who wrote a lot about sort of the neighborhoods you live in and the places that you live have these impacts on, on, on turnout and vote choice. That is a long way of saying that um, it's really hard for us to say really good, reliable things about specific states. 
because that is not the way that we gather most, not all, but most of our election data. Now, there are gonna be survey, or gonna, you know, obviously Georgia was just a little important in 2020. So um, there are gonna be good surveys out there, but they're probably more likely to be public. Some of the uh, CEF data is gonna have Georgia, uh, 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 they're called congressional districts, um, et cetera. Um, and I'm quite certain that if I did a good sort of Google search, I would find some for you. But in general, I, I would argue that political scientists have not been as attentive to these contextual effects that we are seeing so dramatically, as you rightly said, in 2020, in part because the way we sort of structured voting research. Your second question was about issues. Um, uh, so along, let me give the short answer, which I am, I swear to you, uh, capable of doing. Um, Women and men do not vary very dramatically on the issues that we often believe are gonna be important. So if anything, men may be slightly more pro-choice than women are. Um, they may prioritize these issues differently, um, but it's clear that, um, other, that the same sorts of issues dominate the decision-making of men and women. And those are questions of the state of the economy, um, et cetera. Where we see the most differences are on social welfare attitudes. How big should the state be? Um, uh, should we have more health care? Should we have you know, uh, more of a social safety net? And I can't resist making one comment about that, which is again, those stereotypes I was trying to sort of refer to. Traditionally, this has been talked a lot about in terms of women are more compassionate, they're mothers, they care. And so that's why they wanna spend more in education, they wanna spend more in health care, et cetera. And there certainly may be some, some truth to that. Um, but, but no one says that labor union members are super compassionate and, and touchy-feely when they also favor, you know, changes to the mineral, you know, the social safety net, those sorts of things. Um, it's worth saying that, that, that those differences emerge in the 1960s, right around the time that more and more women go to work, and a large majority of the jobs that women uh, held, certainly the job growth in the 70s and on forward, for women are in, guess what? They're public school teachers, they work in hospitals and, and, in, and in healthcare, they work in those caring sectors, right? And so it, it might actually just be their own economic self-interest that it helps explain their, their social workers, et cetera, their investment in those or interest in those issues. Awesome. Thank you so much. And if anyone else has any other questions, feel free to, to raise your hand and we can call on you. I also see a, a follow-up from Wendy in the chat on the question regarding FDR about um, the Eleanor Roosevelt effect and the audience that she had in her women's magazine columns in the 40s and 50s. So we quote some of those columns, uh, particularly in the first book, but, but someone in the second as well. Um, uh, in part because Eleanor Roosevelt, always the pioneer, is the one that keeps saying, women vote like men do. They care about their communities, they care about their own identities, their interests, they're affected by the same sorts of things, race, class, um, religion, et cetera, that affect, that affect men. Um, she did have a huge audience. Um, there, I think we get into some complicated sort of concepts about tokenism, about exceptionality, right? Um, uh, does this one woman pathbreaker um, dramatically shift attitudes about what women are, are capable of doing in politics and encourage other women? Maybe, and there's no question she was those things, um, but we don't have a lot of good systematic evidence of that. And actually, I, I'm working on a new book now about role models and you're making me think, God, that would be so cool if we could measure the impact of, of Eleanor Roosevelt, but that may not be possible. Shut everybody down. Christina, I'll ask a question. Um, can, we, can we draw on you and your historical work to kind of project what you think will happen moving forward in the next, you know, say 10 or 20 years, both with the gender gap, the, the kind of complicated intersectional dynamics that you identified, and also in terms of voter turnout? I'm going to put you on the spot and ask you to speculate. I know that's uncomfortable for social scientists to do, but I think people are really interested in that. So I, I guess I would say a couple of things. One is, um, you know, as a social scientist, the past is the best predictor of the future. Um, and I don't see any systematic changes coming along 
that are going to eliminate, for example, the, the democratic advantage um, that, that the advantage that Democrats have among women. And, and I should, I've said that several times, and I should also be careful about that. Um, one of the problems with talking about the gender gap is, is we say um, women are more likely to vote Democratic, and that sounds like most women vote Democratic. Um, it's important to say that, you know, 80% of women can vote Republican, but if 90% of, of men vote Republican, you're still going to have a 10 point gender gap, right? So it's, 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 it's really a question of, 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 of who you're comparing to, et cetera. Um, I think you are right to emphasize this question of intersectionality. And what I am interested in thinking about as a, as a social scientist is all the exciting things we now can understand uh, and, I, and I hope we'll continue um, sort of going forward, which is um, how do women legislate? How do they run committees? How, how does their different perspectives shape the content of legislation? What does it matter if they're in party leadership? Um, these have been really hard things for us to study historically because there's certainly just, just not enough women, right? Um, we also have this problem since 1992 that most of the women who run are Democrats. Um, that changed a little bit in 2020. And I think Democrat, Republicans are going to really be putting a lot of effort into trying to change that um, going forward. And so uh, as someone whose other world is sort of political parties, I'm really intrigued to see how that plays out. How is gen gender a strategy, a constraint, an opportunity for Republican women, when it absolutely is, compared to how it is for Democratic women? Uh, one of the things I've been watching is right how Democrats are strategically employing gender in these impeachment hearings, um, et cetera. Um, because I work on role models, uh, because I have my own teenagers, <laughs> I'm, I'm really gonna be interested to see how um, these women of color in particular, and particularly uh, with new sort of modes of, of engagement, and of course I'm thinking of AOC here and other sorts of people, are shaping views of politics. Is it open, is it fair, um, uh, et cetera, right? Um, and of course, the fact that they're women of color, I think adds, you know, adds a dynamic. It doesn't, it sounds like there's like spice on top. I mean, it is the dynamic um, and it's so interesting. Um, we have surveys out in the field right now amongst, uh, well, or did over the election period, um, among adolescents with oversamples of black adolescents, uh, Asian adolescents and Latino adolescents. Because I think that, and this comes back to the, the question about Georgia, this comes back to the other sorts of questions, is going to be such an important piece of these stories sort of going, going forward. Um, I'm also, and this is not what you asked, but I'm going to say it anyway. What intrigued me about 2020 is the return of voting as a ritual that people want to engage in. That voting is when you say you're an American citizen, and we know a lot of the declines in voting in the 20th century had to do with sort of, um, why would I want to be involved in this sort of corrupt system? Um, and it's just going to be interesting to watch what is the, what is the long-term impacts of things like what happened in Georgia, of this election, et cetera, where now it's like, I don't care if I have to sit for six hours, it's worth it, right? When I used to talk about voter turnout, I'd say, well, when it rains, people don't go down the rain so they don't vote. Now it's like all these rules and laws, we're gonna overcome them. Um, if only all those rights-oriented groups could be fighting for other things other than letting people get the right to vote. So Christina, I'm gonna to have to put a bookmark on the discussion because we are out of time. We're just at one o'clock. So I wanna extend a warm thank you to Christina for joining us.